round of applause, please, for Dave Lounsbury. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, sir. So it's always a little challenging to, uh, to have the clean-up position for a couple of reasons, one of which is, of course, we're standing between you and your lunch. And the second is that uh, all the good points have already been made. Um, you know, we've heard this, uh, a lot of information, great information on transformation over uh, today um, and for the past couple of days. And hopefully this has given you all a lot of insights into where we think this concept of digital transformation is headed. So I'd like to wrap up by, by taking a little bit of a step back from this, this rush towards digital. Not because I don't believe that we do need to rush for digital, but just because we should understand you know, what's driving it and let that guide where we're going. Um, you know, I think a good question to ask is, you know, is digital, this transformation digital, isn't this just the next step, right? We've always used emerging technologies to uh, advance the, 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 the needs of businesses. Um, so isn't this just the, the same old thing we've always been doing? Or have we, have we crossed some tipping point that makes digital different? And I believe, and I think we heard from many of our speakers, that there is something different this time in the transformation. Um, that we're seeing a convergence of things like all of those uh, computing resources that Rose and other people have talked about and that we all know about. Um, we're seeing that converge with a change in uh, the view, how customers view our market. We're moving from that view where the enterprise uh, sells to a customer to where the customer is starting to pull in the other direction. And uh, also the idea that we've got the workforce now, we've got enough people who understand digital technologies to actually be able to make this all happen. The last thing I believe um, is that the open group is uniquely positioned to take advantage of a window of opportunity. We've, we've heard these similar themes throughout the presentations here. There's this window of opportunity to bring this together and give guidance to the industry to make that transformation, and I believe the open group is the place to make that happen. So what does this take? Um, you know, how did we get here? What do we need to tr thrive in the digital world? And, and how should the open group actually take action on that? I think um, historically, if you look at the history of, of IT and you know, EA coming out to, to manage some of that innovation, it comes from a history of, of scarcity, right? We had these scarce IT resources, and there might be a few people in the room who remember standing at the window handing in the card deck, right? You know, that queue that we did to manage the scarcity of that big machine. Um, and so it's always been how, how we used to use EA to structure and allocate these resources to, um, to maximize the value for the, uh, for the organization. Um, this typically resulted in kind of a narrow set of offerings. You constrained the number of things you did at any one time. Um, it also resulted in that, that inside out customer experience. You know, you know, here's the boxes you can check as a customer and here's how we want you to think. Fill in this form and do the right thing. So um, you know, that, that, that all came from trying to regulate the number of interactions and the use of the resources. There's an alternative view and there's a view of abundance. Um, and we can move past that, that idea of scarcity. And I want to take a look at this here and, and relate it back to what this means for the digital world. And again, you've kind of heard all this, so I'll, I'll kind of try to keep it quick. Um, the first abundance is the one I, I don't think we need to talk about too much, is the abundance of computing. Um, you know, we've, we're all familiar with uh, Moore's Law, which has driven the, the increase of, of both the density of transistors on a chip and as you shrink a transistor on a chip, um, the speed can go up, up to some limits of physics, and that has driven this, this huge increase, uh, continual increase, uh, that you know, may be flattening out a little, and we'll, 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 we'll get to that, but um, uh, resulted in a continuous growth of, of computing power. Spanning my career, uh, <laughs> what's, what's happened in the abundance of computing? Um, I started in the mini computer world. I actually started with Prime Computer. There might be, does anybody remember Prime? Wow, 
Ah, oh, it makes me feel good. So anyway, I couldn't find a picture of a prime 50 series to put on here, but everybody knows the VAX, right? So VAX, um, 1978, uh, cost about $120,000. And I didn't bring it, because I, I keep losing it, is uh, this, this is a Raspberry Pi Zero W. Um, costs 12 euros, I think. And one of those Raspberry Pi Ws has 1,200 times the computing power of that VAX. So $120,000 VAX, you know, call it a $10 Raspberry Pi. Um, $120,000 in 1978 is about a half million dollars in current money. So who, who can do the math? It's 60 million. Uh, that's the change I've seen over my career in the uh, computing power. Uh, for the Americans in the audience, 6.5 centimeters is 2.6 inches. So. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I, I don't know how many of those you could fit in the cabinet, but it's a lot. And of course, you know, we've got that, that scale up of computing power. And of course, if we use, you know, some of the Intel chips, that, that multiplier would be even bigger, right? So, um, you know, what do we do with all that? Well, you know, another way we show this abundance is while, you know, we've got these chips, we take these, these now very capable chips. By the way, that Raspberry Pi, it's single, single chip, four core processor. We take you know, those cores, we put the chips on the board, we put the boards in racks, uh, we put the racks in cabinets, and we fill huge, uh, now purpose-built buildings full of, of computing power here. And uh, we make that computing power available. There are a lot of technical challenges to that, you know, space power, all that stuff, cooling. Uh, there are a lot of technical challenges with that, but, but basically um, you know, it's commoditized the idea of, of a computing cycle. We think of that computing power as a commodity. And the manifestation of this, of this commoditization of computing power is that you know, we, we sell this through innovative business, uh, business models like cloud computing. And because of all that abundance of computing power, you know, see these are two, two you know, very competent, prominent, cloud computing things you can go buy online. What's the two things they have in common from this, uh, from, from this stream? You probably can't, you might not be able to read it. There are two words in common between these two. Can you spot it, Andrew? You got good eyes. Anyway, the word is free. That you can get started at a small scale with, with this cloud computing infrastructure for free, right? You don't need to invest in your computing platform to start your project. Now, of course, you know, as you scale up, you pay more, you, know, you pay your fair share, but computing power is not an obstacle to start getting, uh, uh, to get, getting started. Now, you saw on that curve, I want to talk about other uses, and this, again, Rose has uh, uh, taken all the thunder here. Um, uh, you, you saw that Moore's Law, you know, maybe slowing down a little bit. You, know, you see this angst in the industry. Um, well, that's for single core processors, but there's other kinds of processing that we're seeing emerging from the microcomputer field. You see things like graphical processors. Um, I had some pictures of mobile chips, but they're just chips, right? But we have low power mobile chips um, from, from largely from that telecomputing environment. Uh, and those drive entirely new, new modes of, of interaction with users. Um, you know, this uh, one in, in your mobile phone, we all live in that environment. We live with our mobile phones uh, all the time. We rely on those computing platforms. I'm presenting from my mobile platform here. Um, but you know, that power now does things like we have augmented reality and virtual reality for our customer experiences. This is a view out uh, uh, my office window showing me the way to, to restaurants. Uh, up on top, what you see there, those look like postal vans. They are postal vans, but because of um, you know, some of these high power specialist chips and uh, the emergence of AI, there's no postman in these vans, right? These are autonomous vehicles. Uh, and so these are just entirely new modes of customer interaction. So that's you know, external view. Um, I could have put IoT on here, an equally valid one. Uh, uh, but I want to take another view of, of how we use this abundance, and that is uh, getting back to the internal view of this. 
Uh, one of the big beneficiaries of this abundance of computing is, in fact, the IT function itself. Um, we, we see, uh, to borrow a phrase from our IT for IT folks, uh, uh, the, the uh, IT pipeline is no longer the cobbler's children. And we see practitioners take this computing power to improve and automate uh, their, their production cycles. Uh, and, and radically shrink these to the point where iteration and that, that incremental exploration that we've heard about in all the presentations has become the norm in our marketplace. So we've got you know, things like Agile and DevOps, you know, which probably pretty much everyone's familiar with, you know, putting that emphasis on automation. You know, you know, the technical press, you, know, you read about Docker, you read about Kubernetes, you read about you know, what would we do without JUnit for automated testing these days, right? Um, so we've got that at the development level. Um, the IT management itself is now putting in place robust structures to actually manage that, that ability to rapidly iterate and develop. You know, it's, it's, it's both ways. You know, we need to manage it effectively and we also need to make sure that that's connected to, uh, you know, all phases of development connect back to that, that strategy portfolio and the business drivers. Uh, through, that, through that IT value chain. And of course, IT for IT is the premier reference architecture for doing that right now. Um, you know, there are others like Agile, you know, uh, Scaled Agile Framework, you know, the DevOps stuff, which all play into this. But you know, this all gets to the ability to rapidly iterate and continuously deploy new functionality. And uh, as a result of this, we're, we're very comfortable now as an industry with the idea of iteration and incrementalism as the way of exploring your requirement space or exploring your markets. Another abundance I wanna, I wanna talk about, and this is the one where you think, Dave, you've gone crazy, is an abundance of developers. Now, read any CIO article, analysis, the press, like, oh, you know, top problem is finding talent for doing things. Um, you know, uh, you know, salaries are you know out of control. All this stuff. Um, yeah, maybe. Um, right now, that is a problem. But I think you know, again, we need to be looking forward in this digital world uh, to to uh, more abundance here. Um, yeah, this is a uh, coder school. This is actually right outside a, a supermarket I go to. It replaced a music school. People go there to learn coding now rather than music. And this is Joe Biden, the vice president, at one time the vice president of the United States, learning uh, to do his first line of code by instructed by someone who I think is a fifth of his age. Uh, so, you know, this is one of the critical abundances I think we need to anticipate in the digital world. You know, uh, I think somebody, it was either Rose or, uh, or, uh, Mike, uh, hark back to the first industrial revolution. We think of the first industrial revolution as, as you know, maybe being you know, powered by coal or steam. But the other things that happened there were, were management changes, cultural changes. They learned how to manage effective workforces in factories. Um, they learned how these entrepreneurs took people you know, there was no workforce, you know, to, you know, run knitting mills or, or make pottery, right, for these first industrial revolutions. They took people from the farms. They took people from the cottages and brought them in to make an effective workforce. And that's what I think you're seeing here. Um, the people, who, organizations that can take advantage of this coding abundance will have some strategic differentiation. We're not, the first, we're not the only people to recognize this, by the way. Um, uh, this was a couple of days ago. Uh, Steve Wozniak is launching his digital institute uh, to help everybody gain the skills they need to survive in this uh, digital world. So that's supply side abundance. Let's take a look at uh, abundance from the other side, the, the demand side. Like businesses have exploited these abundances to create you know, new products, new interactions, things like that. Um, let's take a look at how the customers have, have reacted to that. And we've, you know, these are all things, you know, we, we, you know again, the, the problem of cleanup is you see, you're going to use uh, analogies that have come out before. Uh, we live in a, we're immersed in, in a digital world. Um, and we have been for years. Uh, you know, some of the first purely digital products that came out were games. Again, um, Pong, right. It's a year old too. Um, but so that's, that, that's the first purely digital product I saw. What does this look like to my son, right? This, this um, League of Legends, uh, massively delivered online game, their entire convention's built around it. 
So that was gaming, that was kind of the first one, but you know, of course there was uh, music, uh, uh, we all have digital music now, and, uh, and, and video, right? So those are you know, digital products that we're just immersed in. Um, everybody's favorite category for being digital is this, this concept of digital intermediation, where you use uh, digital to provide some new experience for physical products and services. And you know, uh, transportation, uh, lodging, uh, just ordering goods and services, or planning your travel, right? You know, we've, we've seen these all like five times in this uh, event. It's, it's uh, uh, you know, common analogies here. Um, and, and to look beyond, we well, should look beyond, and you think, well, oh, there's a nice user experience, they've got a great web page. Um, but there's a shift, they're indicative of a shift in the marketplace as well. You know, that, that emphasis we put on customer experience is showing kind of a fundamental change in the market. Um, you know, so what is that shift? And, and, and the, the place we see it most is this idea of, of uh, digital personal preference. And right now, we're, we, we come, have come to expect that when we go to one of these digital intermediator sites, they're gonna tell us something about ourselves, right? They're gonna say, you know, here's some books that are recommended for you, Dave. Um, or, or uh, sorry, the, uh, you know, Dave, here's how to plan your travel, right? Or, you know, based on your past purchases, here's what we think we'd like. So that's going beyond, we, that's our expectation, right? The delivery of physical goods. But it's actually going a little bit beyond that, that, that emphasis from, shift from, you know, mass experiences to individual experiences. This is a site, it's called um, uh, uh, M. Taylor, right? M. Taylor, you take a picture of yourself with your phone and you get uh, measured in under 30 seconds um, and you get clothes that, are, that, that fit you, right? It's actually moving from selling you, uh, you know, clothes based on your preferences to clothes that are designed for you, right? This is a, a site that is literally tailoring the physical goods for the customer. And so this trend goes beyond that, that convenient product or services, that customer, you know, one that, that is responding to your preferences to one that is addressing you, you as an individual. So those are some of the abundances. Of course, there's always one anti-abundance, the thing nobody has enough of, right? And that is time. If we actually believe uh, in this iterative approach to uh, how you uh, explore markets or how you define requirements, you must operate inside the loop of your the decision loop of your market. You have to respond more quickly than your market does. And so you have to have all of these processes that are aligned to beat the clock, right? You know, your architecture processes, your IT management processes, your delivery processes, your product definition processes, all have to, have to beat that, that deadline of time. Uh, and so this is, by the way, hardly a new observation, right? Uh, the idea that time to market is a competitive advantage is you know, long before digital. And uh, who can we cite better than Jack Welsh uh, that says uh, you need to change faster than the market or the market will change you. Again, you know, disrupt or be disrupted. So with these things in mind, okay, so this is not a new idea, right? Mark, time to market, oh, big deal. So is this, again, what's, big, what's, what's different about digital, right? Why is it digital different? And no revolution um, comes from a single source. Um, this is a book I, I, I would recommend to people. It's called The Support Economy by Shoshana Zuboff and uh, James Maximum. And uh, they make the point that um, you know, revolutions are always about a convergence of, of multiple causes here. And um, to go back to that first industrial revolution analogy, it was a convergence of technology, like we had coal and steam and things like that. It was a convergence of, of organizational and, and uh, uh, management changes, you know, your strategy changes, you know, how to organize a factory, how to manage workforces, how to develop markets. And it was also a convergence of a change in, um, in market demand. You know, people started saying, 
oh, I, I would like to have some nice plates. I would like to have some nice clothes. That rising expectations of markets that satisfied some of their internal needs. And so they have this idea called the support economy that says the economy of the future is actually going to be focused on the individual. It's going to be about that customer experience, not just the customer experience, but goods and services that are unique for the customer. Right? It's going to replace the mass market. Yeah, you can read the book. You decide whether you believe that or not. But all we've heard today is all about the need for that focus on customer experience and, and customer differentiation. So what's different about digital? You know, we're seeing this convergence again. We've got the abundant digital resources. We've got uh, emerging uh, tools and techniques and organizations that can manage that delivery at speed. And we've got a shift to uh, customer unique products and experiences. And all of that drives the flywheel of digital markets. So what does this mean for us as practitioners? So we know that change always involves people, processes, and tools. So what do we need to take advantage of some of those convergences? You know, from a process perspective, again, we've heard a lot of this before. Um, I uh, really like Mike's presentation on his four forces. Uh, we have a, a white paper that has been published uh, by the Open Group, Seven Levers of Digital Transformation. And you see the same themes coming out again. Uh, you know, that these changes, you know, there are going to be these broad changes that move us from, you know, from you know, changing, in, uh, changing our operating models, transforming our business processes to uh, implement those operating model changes, focusing on you know, customer engagement, customer experiences, customer unique products, and then making sure that we've got um, the digital products that can fulfill those needs and that core of ability to deliver in that market. And that will drive changes in our corporate strategies and our, corp and our organizational cultures. And you can learn more details, but I can't explain this all in uh, in the time I've got left here, which is going fast. Um, but uh, please uh, download the white paper from the, the new Open Group Library and uh, uh, tell, uh, tell us what you think. Another thing we're seeing uh, in, in, as a part of the digital experience, which is a bit, a bit different, is this idea that this is all going to happen at different scales, that, that things are going to scale up, either because they're you know, new startups, which is the, sort of the easy model, but also, you know, maybe experiments inside larger corporations as a way of, of, of making their transformation. And that we need to uh, acknowledge this concept that some of these, these processes are going to be emergent ones. That, you know, things that will work for an individual contributor, the skills and, and practices you need at that level, aren't the skills you need to work at a team level. And that when you get to the team of team, you, know, you bring in all sorts of new things about organization and culture, uh, you know, investment. I won't read all these um, things that are needed to do that. And as you get to the enterprise, we've got many teams across multiple organizational boundaries. You need to think about much broader concepts. So we need to both give guidance as we develop our digital, um, our digital uh, approach. We need to give guidance to people at all these levels. And we need to pay attention to telling people how they're going to get from level to level to say the skills you might have had at, at this level, you know, here's what you need to add to get to the next level. And, and that needs to be not only uh, you know, guidance you know, at the, the framework level, but we need to be able to actually give guidance to the people who do this, right? You know, you know, culture is made up of the reactions of people, so we need to get this, this information in a way that the people can consume it. And so any article you read about digital transformation will talk about the need for a digital workforce. Uh, this is from McKinsey, uh, and I'll, you, know, you can read it on the screen. Uh, so you know, we'll, we'll need to give guidance at, the, at all those levels I just mentioned. We'll need to give it at the executive level. We're going to need to give it to the people you've already got engaged. You know, there's the people who know your markets and goods uh, better than anyone else. Um, uh, but we also need to find people to uh, ways of bringing in new people, those coder school graduates, that, that, that workforce that is yet to be, that will become your strategic differentiator into this digital culture. So you need to learn to develop that talent. And so we need to, and much as those first 
uh, Industrial Revolution entrepreneurs. And the, the one in the book is uh, Josiah Wedgwood, who brought people in from cottages and, and the field and made them into an effective workforce producing you know, the, the world's most famous uh, 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 crockery um, through strategy, business organization, workforce management, and technological innovation, those three drivers again. So we need to find a way to do that as part of our digital direction as well. Doing so will mean we need to give guidance to different ways that people learn. This is uh, Shu Hari. Um, if you either if you if you do agile uh, methodology or you practice Aikido, you may have heard this, but it's the idea that at the uh, basic level, people need a checklist of, that they will follow in a rote manner of what to do. But at some point, you start to generalize that. You say, oh, I could do this a little bit differently and it'll be more efficient. And then at some point, you take that farther step back and say, oh, well, let me think about how this is all put together and, and we'll, change, uh, we'll change our approach that way. We'll change it more strategically. We'll change it more functionally. This is a little, maybe a little bit of a change for the open group. Uh, typically, uh, we target the, the top level practitioners, that this transcendent audience of, of practitioners here. Um, but as we go forward in the digital world, we'll need, we know we need to actually get some things for these, these other styles of learning as well. So this gets me to, I've talked about the open group and you know, directions. So how does the open group respond? Again, I believe the open group is uniquely positioned to uh, uh, bring some of these ideas of abundance together. Um, you know, there's no one group inside the open group who has the whole answer, but I think if we bring together some of the things that are already going on inside open group forums and do some additional work to, to fill the gaps and we can uh, actually come to be the leaders in this space. Um, and we've got the ecosystems in place and the partnerships in place to do this. These key themes, again, You've heard them all in the presentations today. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on them. The idea of customer unique products and experiences, that these need to be driven by um, perceptions, customer-led perceptions of value, that we need to have uh, be prepared to give guidance to do this digital operation at all different scales of, of, of enterprises and partnerships. Um, and in, as part of that, we need to respect this concept of emergence and that we'll need to guide people through uh, transition points, uh, the idea that we'll iteratively and incrementally explore markets and do that in a, through continuous delivery. It's not like, yep, we're going to do transformation, now we're done, right? It's going to be a continuous delivery process. That obviously needs to be managed at, with processes that work at the speed of the market, and that will all be implemented by a competent digital workforce. You know, an area that's of, of great concern to the open group is what's the role of enterprise architecture in this? Enterprise architecture clearly pays a core role in this, but we need to make sure that we're giving, again, I'm gonna use the guidance word a lot, you're gonna be sick of it. Um, we need to be able to apply the, the strong foundation of, of enterprise architecture in an agile way. We need to be able to uh, quickly do um, the, the more strategic parts of EA in a way that we can put the framework in place for digital evolution. Um, and then we need to also have, and we heard this many times today, we need to actually have uh, the EA framework in place and the decisions in place to actually guide and constrain the agile teams that do the implementation with the enterprise architect function being integral to the team. And it may, might not be enterprise architects, but it will be enterprise architecture as a job skill or a participant for someone in the team. We needed to have effective management that works at speed. Well, you know, IT for IT is, you know, the, the good reference model uh, for high output high IT management. Um, you know, in the digital world, we need to think about how we profile that so that we can give that guidance to, to different levels of emergence or different levels of complexity uh, in, in an organization as they, as they build out their digital capability. Um, this is an example from another white paper that I'll recommend to people towards a digital professional body of knowledge. And this is uh, one of our members has uh, taken this concept of 
you know, what parts of IT for IT would you need when you're working at the team level, you're a small team, what parts of IT for IT do you have to have in place? So we've got that mapping. We need to build that out. We need to actually uh, develop that kind of IT for IT guidance based on the, the foundation of the standard for different levels of emergence. Uh, I think actually doing that will help drive the adoption of IT for IT as well as improving the foundation for, for digital. Finally, I want to talk to uh, Platform 3.0 people. I see some of you, you know, uh, uh, in the audience here. You know, Ron's over there. Um, obviously, this all runs on a platform. We've heard about platforms earlier in the, in the uh, talk. Um, I, third platform really needs to provide the reference architecture for all phases of the digital transformation, you know, from development to deployment and operation. We should probably include even uh, you know, the tooling, we, we, need to ex, we need to encompass the, uh, the DevOps uh, principle of automate everything, um, run everything continuously. Uh, so that we'll need to get to our, uh, uh, incorporate our uh, architecture tools in there. The other thing is the, uh, the developer must be viewed as a top tier client of the third platform. We need to include all of the tools you need to do that continuously delivery. The automation, the, um, the uh, package management, you know, all that, all that stuff. I won't dictate which ones. There are some obvious leads, but we need to get those in there. So we bring it all together. And we see that we've got some of these foundations already in place, either work that's ongoing in the forms or work that you know, will probably need to be done in the form. The concept of how we do EA in an agile way high output IT management map to appropriate scale, the, presenting a digital platform. And there's one more thing. We've talked about the workforce management and what it'll take to bring people along at all levels. So we need to develop a body of knowledge for digital practitioners. To that end, we've uh, started a uh, work group at the, uh, of the open group called the Digital Practitioners Work Group. And uh, you can see here the objective is to develop and promote understanding of what it means to be digital and the best practices for organizations to provide that uh, digital customer experience. Nice thing about being a work group, it's open to all members of the open group so we can coordinate our activities across forum boundaries. Uh, the group is very much in its, its early you know, uh, formational stages. Uh, we're collecting input on direction and developing a roadmap for what we're gonna deliver. Uh, Venkat's the chair right now, uh, so Venkat is out there somewhere. Um, uh, but you can see any of us if you want to get involved. Uh, now's a good time to get involved because you can get in on the ground floor and you can see the URL there. So my time is up, but uh, I want to just say um, the open group can only get things done because the members actually bring their expertise, knowledge, work, hard work uh, to this, so please join us in the forums or in the Digital Practitioners Work Group to help make this happen. And if we do that, the open group can be the place to develop digital guidance for the future. So thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Please take a seat. We do have some, some questions. <clears throat> the place for digital guidance. I like it. Okay. All oh, right. So, um, first question came in very early while you were talking. Um, no doubt. Uh, did you consider to factor in TPUs that break and outrange Moore's law by their architectures and massive computing power? You know, uh, if somebody wants to make an argument that there are, are ways of getting more computing abundance, bring it on, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, there are lots of ways of scaling up. There are ideas here that I don't even want to get into, things like, you know, we, we have a number of members who are working on quantum computing techniques, which will, you know, again, with orders of magnitude improvements. So, yeah, absolutely, you know, if, there are, if you have a vision of, of what that means for a digital market, you know, please bring it in, because, it, it, again, it is part of that abundance of computing. Well, related, in fact, same person. When do you think the von Neumann architecture is replaced by a more brain-style architecture enabling massive parallel computing and storage access? 
if, if, I could, if I could predict things like that, I probably would have a completely different job like in, 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 in the markets, no, in, in, in playing the stock market. <clears throat> um, the, uh, you know, we're seeing, I, 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 uh, I, I think we're actually right on the edge of, of the, the quantum computing uh, revolution. We are seeing quantum computers out in the marketplace. We're seeing people like NASA buy those quantum computers to solve a certain class of community problem. And several of our platinum members are working on it. So, so that's, that's definitely on the watch list. Uh, and that's clearly you know, the replacement of the von Neumann architecture. Uh, what are the skills architects need to, protect, to prepare for this future? Yeah, I think the, um, the, the, the skills there, and uh, there's quite a good body of work going on in the, uh, the Agile EA work group and, and talking about those. Um, the idea of iteration, um, the idea of fast guidance, setting up the frameworks to constrain um, Agile teams, um, you know, the, the, the principal breach we need to bridge in, in the IT world is, you know, that, that gap between what, you know, agile practitioners think of EA and what EA thinks of agile practitioners. So, um, you know, thinking about how to, how to give that guidance at speed and the guidance at the weight those kinds of teams uh, can, can consume is, is to me the, the key thing that needs to, to happen. Um, you didn't mention the security forum when uh, in, in your talk, the security forum at the Open Group. Surely that plays a role in the direction for the Open Group. Yeah. Well, there's, there's lots of dimensions of that. Um, a, a thing that will need to happen, obviously part of your strategy for deployment will be looking at potential security vulnerabilities and you'd want to use some of the tools we've got like you know, Open Fair to do the risk analysis of where you're vulnerabilities are and how exposed you are. Um, I think there's more work to be done on the idea of how we do security in that, that massively distributed environment. Um, that's, that's to me very much an open issue and that's something that needs to be brought into the open group. And uh, last question, last question, yeah. Um, either of us could take this, I guess, but I'm gonna let you do it. Will the Open Group assign a CDO, a Chief Digital Officer, and how would that relate to Dave as CTO? So maybe, uh, maybe I'll take the first part. I'd love to, love to have the resources for a Chief Digital Officer. Um, so uh, maybe one day we will, but if we genericize that, how would that type of role work with the CTO, for example? Um, how would it relate to the CTO? Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the things anybody who knows me knows, I, I, I don't let titles and structure bother me much. Um, there is plenty of opportunity uh, for that kind of digital transformation at the open group. You know, we get a lot out of these physical meetings. We get a lot of work done in the virtual meetings. You know, do we have, do we have that individually focused customer experience uh, in, in our da daily operation? I think that's actually a pretty good question. Um, I think that would be something that would encompass a lot of different aspects of our management team. You know, how we lead it, again, this is a, uh, you know, an emergence question. You know, how do we move the open group from the, the level we are now to a level where we are you know, massively bigger? Um, it really is kind of one of those uh, good to great questions. And whether we call that you know, the chief digital officer or just good continuous process improvement, you know, I think I'd worry about that later. I'd worry about the customer value as the starting point. Absolutely. Dave, we're going to leave it there and let these people get to lunch, yep. but uh, thank you for a great job. Thank you.